All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome back to the Everything College Football Podcast. Today, we Nick here. We know 2023 preview and prediction for the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. We know this coaching staff, Brent Key. Interim tag was removed following a 4-4 four and four end to the season in 2022 following GF Collins' departure. He's been on the staff since 2019. Buster Faulkner, he'll be the offensive coordinator. He spent the past three years as a quality coach with the Georgia Bulldogs. And then Andrew Thacker, Kevin Shear, fifth and first seasons respectively with Georgia Tech will anchor the defensive coordinator positions. The Yellow Jackets, Nick, I think the biggest headline here is swing and miss potentially on Deion Sanders. And, you know, they appear to be a competitive team. I think the only other argument can be made to why Deion Sanders was not brought in. I thought he'd be the favorite. And I think they'd make a hard push towards it. Is it they didn't have any money or they just didn't care following Jeff Collins' departure? I think it certainly is an interesting thing to look at. You know, Deion Sanders seemed like a home run. We discussed this during the season before he took the Colorado job, you know, played in Atlanta, you know, probably rose to his most fame while playing for the Falcons, also did some time playing for the Braves, you know, a key figure in Atlanta, popular figure. The recruiting would have been so easy there. I think academics certainly played a role in this. I think Deion Sanders would have had a difficult time getting in some of his players based off the academic, you know, kind of how tough academically Georgia Tech is. It is a very tough academic school. It's a very, very high class school, one of the, one of the best schools academically in the country, certainly in the Southeast. So I think that's part of I think some of the funding as well might be an issue. I think, you know, Colorado's giving Dion a blank check to write whatever he really wants and bring in who he wants. I think Georgia Tech would have more restrictions, have been tougher to recruit, certainly in some regards. It is a swing and a miss for me, though. I think Deion Sanders could have made it work, could have been a flashy hire, could have added some attention to the Yellow Jackets. But really, for you know, for the last 10, 15 years or so, it's been kind of a bottom-tier program in college football, just really not attracting any sort of attention. They seem to just go out, play the season, lose a bunch of games, rinse and repeat. There isn't a whole lot of excitement in Atlanta. The Georgia Bulldogs certainly have taken over the state. They own that state in terms of the attention span. And it's disappointing for a school like Georgia Tech that plays in such a big city, big market, historic stadium. Bobby Dodd's a beautiful stadium, great campus in, in the heart of Atlanta. It really is a shame they can't quite put together a competitive team on the field. Hopefully, Brent Key can find a way to do that. Now, over those final eight games, they did beat Pittsburgh, beat Duke, back-to-back wins there, 16-9 loss against Virginia. They even held up their own against Bulldogs, losing 37-14 in a game. It was actually quite close to that first half. Florida State had their way a bit with them, but they also held up very well against North Carolina late in the year, holding that offense only 17 points. So they were certainly more competitive. We'll see how long that lasts, but it certainly was not due to what this offense was able to accomplish. 125th in points per game, 113th in yards per contest. You know, this is a unit that certainly was, of course, going undergoing that schematic change under GF Collins, but I think enough time has passed. That's no longer an excuse from the Paul Johnson days. They lose 10 players to the portal. They added nine, six of which were at wide receiver. So this is a bit of a revamped offense. They returned five starters. They were ninth in FBS in turnover margins. That's one thing that was certainly pretty for them. 122nd on third downs, though. Just a whole lot of bad things going for them. You look at the quarterback position, Zach Pyron showcased some good arm strength. Didn't seem the belt in the pocket. You know, he was decisive as a runner. The guy was 6'3", 213, so has some nice size. Doesn't shy away from contact. A competitive player. Those are the notes I took away from his final few starts of the year limited action. He's going to be battling against Haynes King coming over from Texas A&M. This is a player that has adequate arm strength, must be accounted for in the run game with some good athleticism, a quick release, some nice accuracy on those shorter throws, has good touch and can get it downfield, but accuracy has been an issue, as has mechanics. Uh, he also sails a lot of throws. So who do you think is going to be the starter here, Nick? Because King, A&M fans, they were incredibly high on this guy, me not so much. He now finds his way to Atlanta the battle against Pyron, who already has a bit of an edge here in this offense. I think Pyron's going to be the guy that gets the starting. Hayes King certainly has potential, very talented P player. We saw that in the flash of the AM. Of course, you know, beat Alabama certainly was an impressive thing to see out of him, right? There is some serious talent there. A good quarterback. I think that Pyron's just going to get the nod here. I think Pyron's got a little bit more potential. I think he fits better in kind of what they're going to work and try and build around here, this offense they're going to build. There is some potential, but both these quarterbacks I think they both have some talent. I think Pyron just has that better arm strength, a little bit better in the pocket. Also, you know, he doesn't. He's not afraid to get hit. So he has that kind of ability to run after, run, run for first downs. Is not afraid to use his body when he needs to. I think Pyron's got to be the starter here for me. But I think Hayes King is a talented piece. He can keep his head straight and kind of get back to that form that we saw in flashes at AM. Now this running game was a far cry from what you saw under Paul Johnson in that triple option. But I do think they have a nice little duo here of Dante Smith, an elusive runner, some good quick bounce of his feet, good boundary runner. Mixed with Travion Cooley, great speed coming over from Louisville, covers a lot of ground very quickly, has been efficient. He's done solid work as a pass catcher. I think the biggest part of this offense I think I'm impressed with most is the wide receiver work in the portal. Abdul Janai, 6'3", 180, had nearly 600 yards and nine touchdowns last year at Duquesne. Christian Leary, Dominic Blaylock, Chase Lane. These guys all come over from SEC teams. 
Alabama, Georgia, and Texas A&M, respectively. Leak Rutherford, he's the only pass catcher returning to have 100 plus yards last year with 23 wrecks for 225 yards. So even though they do add a lot of talent here, a lot of players are certainly notable to you know the above average casual fan. It's not very encouraging considering they don't have much returning production at the same time coming from this passing attack. There really is not a lot of returning production here. I think Smith's a decent runner. I think he's got some good speed, you know, quick bounce, you know, can get out of bounds, pick up some nice yards. I think Cooley's not a bad runner either. Christian Leary, people, Bama fans, you know, myself included, are high on just didn't quite work out in Tuscaloosa, so couldn't quite find that way onto the field. You know, I think they lock. I think Lane are two solid pieces as well from the SEC. There's some potential there. You know, Rutherford's not a bad piece, but when he's a returning wide receiver, with that sort of production, it's definitely concerning. This offense is a whole new offense. They're, they really don't return much at all, which isn't saying much considering the offense wasn't very good last year. You know, 109th in, point, in points per game or pass yards per game, uh, you know, 91st in rush yards per game. Overall, this offense only scored 17.2 points per game. So there's a lot of room to grow here for this offense. Now, you know, the offensive line, you know, the play up front needs to improve significantly. It was one of the nation's worst groups a season ago. And the only add in the portal was a tackle from Charlotte and Jordan Brown, 6'4", 315. They do return both tackles in Corey Robinson and Jordan Williams, but these guys combined for 54 pressures and 12 sacks allowed. That's not good. Williams may kick inside the right guard. They do get back a veteran in Weston Franklin at center. Third most reps among offensive linemen on this team, uh, and the guys above him were the only ones that played more than him. He was a liability in his own right. Um, this offensive line, I'm really not sure how much better they'll be. I don't think it's going to be a lot. Um, top to bottom, I think this offense is just not going to be very good. So I'm going to give it a C, even though I do think there's a couple of interesting pieces, maybe for playing my DraftKings fantasy, uh, but that's really about it. There are some interesting pieces here, but this offense is just not great. I don't see a lot of improvement here. This offensive line did not improve like they needed to. They really did not go out and grab anyone from the portal they needed to. They only made that one move in the portal overall. I think this is just a tough offensive line, a tough offense overall. Obviously, it's a long, long rebuild in Atlanta for this team, but I think this offense... There just isn't enough talent here for this offense to be productive this year. They a lot of question marks. A lot of guys have a lot of a lot of points to prove. It certainly could be home runs potentially in small doses, but overall this is a tough offense. I don't I don't see a lot of production production here. Well, on the defensive side of the ball, 28 points per game allowed last year, a little over 400 yards per game. Geoff Collins, uh, you know, top billing was that he was a former defensive coach, and you know he was kind of a mastermind in that regard, but never really showcased it here with the Yellow Jackets. They return six starters. They lose their top three tacklers and top tackle for loss getters. They also lose 11 guys to the portal. They added six, including Braylon Oliver and Andre White at linebacker. Those are going to be the most, most notable additions here. Look at the defensive line. Defensive tackle Devon Dose, 6'2", 282. It was actually a really good run stop for him. Slovenia to join from Belgium. He had his moments. Uh, you know, the def new defensive line coach, Mario Coleman. Uh, you know, I think this is a guy that certainly has an interesting group to work with. You know, there's some big shoes to fill here with Keon White's departure. Ito Soda Rubin was a good player for Clemson in 2021. He was his best as a defensive tackle. The unit as a whole has plenty of experience in terms of snaps, but production and impact, uh, you know, that appears far and few. But again, Dose is a good player. And then picking up a guy from Clemson, that's certainly never a bad addition. Nick, thoughts on the defensive line? I think Dose is a solid piece of nose tackle. I like what he can do. I think he's got some good size, a really talented piece. I think he's, you know, underrated. You know, it's 6'2", 282, good run stopper. I like his size. Like you said, grabbing a piece from Clemson there, I think that's not a bad player to have at defensive tackle. I think he's a good, solid piece. Overall, I think and Noah Collins is not a bad piece either. I think he's a solid guy to have in there. Junior has some experience in the past with this defense. It's not a great defensive line, but there is some potential upside here. I think there's some guys that have some talent. I got the linebacking core. You know, Charlie Thomas and Aidy Ellie last year made up one of the nation's best duos at linebacker. They depart, and the notable, only notable return is going to be Trianus Tatum, who is below average. Minnesota transfer Braylon Oliver. He was always touted for his athleticism. Then Andre White, you know, he had 35 tackles in seven games for the Aggies. Really struggled against the run. This linebacking group, this is really depleted, Nick. I do like that they went out and added two pretty notable transfers. These are guys, you know, I remember talking about last year. So that's certainly encouraging. But they lose a lot of production here in the middle. And depth is certainly not something that's, uh, you know, a premium at all. Tatum's not a bad piece. He has some potential as a junior played in this defense last year. Had 31 total tackles. They grab Oliver and White out of the portal. I think those are two solid pieces to add. I think White, you know, you certainly get concerned about his ability against the run. He really struggled against the run. I think Oliver is a solid piece from Minnesota. He's got some good experience. Overall, this linebacking unit's very shallow. Not a lot of depth there and certainly concerns about that. Looking at the secondary, this is probably the best positional group on the entire football team. KJ Wallace really struggled last year but gained some notable experience. Keenan Johnson was very solid for him and his limited reps. 
he will take on a star role outside corner, as was Miles Sims, who was better in double the snaps of Johnson. Well, Miles Brooks, the team's best player, he was great in coverage. He should occupy that full safety role full time. Good physicality and versatility for his size of 6'2, 192. He's a player that I think is going to get a lot of not- not- uh, notables here on these preseason all conference teams. And then Clayton Lee Powell, a true freshman they got to go in the second half of the season. He really shined in his own right as a run defender. They had 11 interceptions last year, and they were 47th against the pass. I think the secondary, top to bottom, is the best positional group on this football team, which doesn't say much, but I, do, I definitely think this is a unit you're going to have to circle when you play them on a week-to-week basis. I think there is some talent here. I think Brooks and Powell Lee are both not too bad pieces. You know, they had 100 total tackles combined, two and a half tackles for loss for Brooks. He's a talented piece. I think the secondary is not bad. I think these two safeties have some serious talent. I think those are some nice pieces. you got to definitely keep an eye out for them. Now, this team had 28 sacks a season ago. Of course, 11 in interceptions as well. So playmaking was certainly not bad. But again, Keon White's gone. Those linebackers are gone. So I definitely think this team needs to avoid a recession in the front seven. And the run defense at the same time needs to make some improvements. Remains to be seen if that will happen. Looking at the preview and prediction, you know, the Yellow Jackets have done a good job beefing up the skill positions. But overall, just average group still. Uh, the QB battle is interesting as those are quality players that may, you know, have some further upside. But the Horde offensive line is not going to be much better. I think that's going to dictate much of what goes on on this side of the ball. You know, Gian Collins, GF Collins finally got this defense pointed in the right direction, but it wasn't enough. So but I definitely think Andrew Thacker staying as the defensive coordinator should help with continuing to build up this football team. But the defensive line is likely going to regress. The middle of the defense loses, you know, absurd pos- uh, production front seven as a whole destined to let down a promising secondary that will continue to progress forward as the pass rush and the run defense will suffer this football team's over under is at four and a half nick i can't believe that number is that high this is not an easy schedule one bit especially when you look at what they face in the month of september and then in conference not any easier i think at virginia will pick up a win there and the two non-conference uh blunders against se state and bowling green this is gonna be a tough year for georgia tech all around i don't see more than three wins they do pick up a fourth maybe a boston college or a syracuse but this is gonna be a tough year and i'd be hammering the under i'm gonna hammer the under as well i think this is a tough year overall i think four and a half is very high for this team you know starts off at against louisville at home playing in the mercedes-benz superdome you know i think that's interesting game just kind of started off but then you look at it you know at old miss at wake at clemson at virginia very tough road games they host north carolina they host syracuse they host georgia obviously rivalry game this is a tough schedule it's a rebuilding team i think brent key has potential to rebuild this team but i think there is some serious restrictions of course like i said the academic restrictions as well as overall just investment from the university they're really not focused on football at georgia tech and so i don't blame them they're a very prestigious institution overall i think the yellow jackets have a long history and i certainly wish they could get back to being competitive they're a very historic college football program i just don't see them getting back to that anytime soon this is gonna be a long year in atlanta i think the next couple of seasons will be long seasons in atlanta this team is just not really in a position to compete right now in the acc to me for today's episode guys as always nick i appreciate joining me to break down the yellow jackets absolutely if you guys like comment subscribe see you next time